present this panel and exhibition on the occasion of George Heiss's 75th birthday and 60th year in photography. Um, his documentation of the urban landscape of New Jersey is groundbreaking, and today's panel offers distinct perspectives on his photography and his important place in the pantheon of American photography. I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists today, um, David Godin, Dr. Stephen Hahn, and Dr. Mary Kay Bergen. David Godin is the founder and publisher of David R. Godin, Inc., a small independent publishing house that has published three books of Tice's photography, um, including Seacoast, Maine, Photographs by George Tice, George Tice Selected Photographs, and Fields of Peace, a Pennsylvania German album. And Urban Romantic. And Urban Romantic. I'm sorry for that oversight. Um, Dr. Stephen Hahn is Associate Provost and Professor of English at William Patterson. His scholarship focuses on the poetry of William Carlos Williams, and he organizes a biennial conference devoted to the author at William Patterson. Uh, William Carlos Williams is perhaps most well known for his poem about the city of Patterson, and Dr. Hahn has been fascinated with, with Tice's similar exploration of the city, and he will be talking about the relationship between the two um, today. Um, Dr. Mary Kate O'Hare is a former curator of American art at the Newark Museum, where she curated the exhibition Seeing Beyond the Moment, the Photographic Legacy and Gifts of George Tice. She will discuss this exhibition that celebrates Tice's career as a photographer, master printer, teacher, and contributor to the museum's photographic collection. Um, so finally, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that we co-organize this panel in collaboration with the Friends of the Chang Library, and I would like to thank Dean Ann Celebrity, who's here in the back, um, for her support and her involvement to make this possible. Um, so um, the format is that um, the panelists are going to speak for about 10 minutes each off um, their own perspective on Tice's work. And then they'll cover um, several discussion questions, and then there'll be the opportunity for the public to um, ask questions. Um, so thank you again, and I'm going to turn it over to the okay. um, I'm just going to try to speak a little bit about George's involvement with books, because I think this is interesting. Normally, photographers don't have the vaguest idea of how books are made or the process that involves taking very small dots and breaking down what is basically a half tone image and then printing it properly on a paper via offset, which is until recently how all these books were produced. This is changing, but if you're a trade publisher, that's basically what we do. We take a full tone photograph and we look at it through a screen, we take a photograph of it and then using two separate colors and usually shooting that photograph at two separate angles, you get as close to reproducing the full tone of the photograph as you possibly can. And George, I think partially because he's a technician, um, really understood this process right from the beginning, right from Fields of Peace, which is a book that we basically redesigned, and reshot, and redid. And I still think it's the most beautiful book probably to give this church. Um, and he was really fun to work with because, you know, he knew enough to be dangerous and sometimes a pain in the ass, but <laughs> normally his instincts were right in the money. And, you know, part of the questions you ask when you do these books is, do you do them in coated paper or uncoated paper? I mean, it's a question that probably doesn't occur to anyone, but it's a major question when you're doing a photo book. How big should the books be? And we've done books as small as this, which is really one of my favorites because it, it's tougher, much tougher to produce and edit and print a small book than it is a big book to Urban Romantic, which was probably the largest photo book we did of George's, which was this size. Um, and George would come and he would really have a very sure and specific idea of how the photographs would be sequenced and sized. Two different things. Because a book, when you think about it, is not one page. You're never looking at one page. You're always looking at a spread. You're looking at two conjugate images or a blank in an image. Those are the only two options you have. Um, so how big they are, how they're sequenced, how they occupy this frame, which is made up of the paper, 
is one that most photographers don't think about at all. They just give you a stack of photographs and they say, well, is there a book here? And you know, there may be a book there, but it's very seldom the book that ultimately evolves from that stack of photographs. And George really thought this through, I think, carefully. Every one of the books, and every one of the books was very different. Um, from the, the Amish book, The Fields of Peace, to this, which was a selection of his photographs, to the urban romantic, which was primarily urban photographs. Um, I love them. I, I, you know, I first encountered these photographs when I was a kid at the Wicken Gallery, and this was back in what the '70s, I guess. Wicken had just opened a photo gallery in New York, and he was showing, you know, now people that we appreciate as the masters, but at that point. They were relatively unknown and relatively inexpensive, and he had a show at George's, which was just, I think, a stunner. Um, and so it's, it's been a real, we haven't done all the books. George, by the way, has done 18 books, I think, and that's a lot of books. I don't think there's another living photographer in America, living photographer, who's done that many books. The early ones were truly terrible. Um, the later ones are truly wonderful. I mean, there's been a real arc here of development, which you see. Uh, and I just, I, I wrote the introduction to this, and it's, I think it's worth quoting, but it's probably worth quoting George first, because I love this quote from Urban Romantic. It talks about how he got started, and he got started, you know, somewhat in the Navy. I think one photograph was picked by Steichen for the, for the museum, and he joined this, camera club, we met this character named Artie Van Barkham, I think this is still in this one of the books. And he sort of learned, you know, it wasn't a precious development. It was really, um, I won't say blue collar, but this was not an art school that he learned at. He wasn't looking at the great masters of photography. He was really following his own instincts, and his own eye, especially was following New Jersey. And what interests me about the work is that it's, it's totally American, even when he goes abroad, I think it's totally American. And he takes segments of American life, like Lincoln or Patterson or the Amish or the main landscape, and he really sort of deconstructs this in his photographs, and then he arranges the photographs in the way of the book, that you really get a definitive sense of what what this was, in the case of Maine, I believe, was 20 years ago, and Maine has changed. But he said in this book, I saw the Amish farmer as a complete man, self-sufficient and content, dependent only on himself and the earth. I saw the same qualities in the life of the Maine fishermen. In the mining towns of Bodie, I examined the gravestones of the men who took their dreams west. I discovered primeval America in the forest of Pecanus. In Patterson, quote, the cradle of American industry, I saw a vision of America gone wrong. Her beauty was altered, her waters were poisoned. A few miles downstream, I found Ari Van Blarkham, an ordinary man, tending his little garden. Photography is whatever we want it to be. It teaches us to see, and we can see whatever we wish. When I take a photograph, I make a wish. I was always looking for beauty. I think that's a wonderful statement. And I wrote about it, and I'll just end with this. I do get into William Carl Swift, so we're going to do that better than I do. Um, I say about his photographs, I guess this is what I find wonderful about them. What makes Tice so instantly recognizable as a photographer is more than a subject matter. He has the uncanny ability to see and indelibly record the monumental and metal embedded in the ordinary. The image can be of a waiter, a water tower in Rahway, which is the one hidden by the screen here, um, like some futuristic machinery out of an H.G. Wells film, looming over the tangled patterns of an ancient tree, the brilliant, almost surreal radiance of the crenellated white tower, white tower castle, glistening in the night like a whitewashed medieval castle the innocent swagger of two Amish boys returning from school of a mountain stream in Vermont. I hope the Amish, is the Amish Pat White Tower here? God, I love that photograph. 
A second aspect of these photographs that seems striking to me, almost preternatural, is the stillness they possess. They have the genius for stopping movement and moments in time, for creating a certain majesty of stasis and silence. It is possible that this is simply the result of a large lens and long exposure, that so many of these images appear to seat themselves securely in both space and time, to define a moment both in terms of its action and its mass. And I think that's, when you look around the room, you really sense that there are a few photographs here where people are in motion or you, there's action in any normal terms of the words. There are really moments frozen in time. Just I iconic images of things we take for granted in daily life. And lastly, I just think he's a terrific technician. I mean, if you're a, <clears throat> if you're a publisher who really cares how books are produced, this really interests you because you can only make a book as good as what you're given. You can't improve in the original. If you're given a lousy photograph, you can't make it somehow beautiful. And George gives you the best material in the world to work with. So your job as a, as a technician is, you know, how do I get that using a basically inferior method offset photography from one technology to another technology? And that's a real, that's a real challenge. It's getting easier, but in the early days it wasn't easy, as George's and our early books proved. It was a real struggle. And that's about all I have to say. Uh, so, uh, my perspective uh, on uh, George's uh, uh, photography uh, as it developed over the years, I, I saw uh, Patterson when he came out uh, in the early 1970s. I was a, I was a uh, student uh, getting through school on scholarships and so on, and the book cost $17.50, and I didn't have $17.50 to uh, spend on a luxury. Um, and, uh, uh, but I would go to a bookstore, um, first in Amherst, Massachusetts, where they had a copy and I get it there. Um, and then uh, at Rutgers, um, because Rutgers University Press had published it. Um, and you know, by the time um, I got to buy a copy, it was a rare book and uh, it cost a lot more than $17.50. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I had uh, an interest in William Carlos Williams from about the same time, from the 1970s, um, and had looked at them both, both the, uh, William Carlos Williams' poem Patterson and George's book Patterson side by side for a lot of years. And then I was asked to, uh, to uh, it was the 50th anniversary of a, a literary journal, and I was asked to uh, write a, a write an essay on Tyson Williams. So I thought, well, that's, what do I do with that? That's difficult. Um, so uh, I started to write it, and besides the, the subject matter and the title, um, I went to the thing that was most in common between the, the two works, and that was the introductions to the, the introduction. George had written to Patterson, and the introduction of Carlos Williams had written to his battles. And through that, I discovered that they were really actually doing something very similar and something um, that I had actually studied and written about, um, which is, in, in terms of literary history, um, sort of forms of, of storytelling and forms of representation um, evolve over time and they adapt to new circumstances. And basically, a real short thing about William Carlos Williams is William Carlos Williams develops out of the Romantic tradition, and this will have something relevant to say about urban romantic, the Romantic part of, of, of that phrase. Um, and they have modern writers uh, adopt, uh, adapt of uh, these older forms, which really come out of medieval romance, quest romance, if you will, and you think about quest, quest for the Holy Grail, um, <clears throat> people going to, on pilgrimages, people going to holy places, or people uh, seeking out holy objects, or going back to places of origin to find out where they came from. Um, and that's 
a lot of what uh, was encapsulated in George's discussion about what brought him to Patterson and uh, what led him to take a lot of these photographs. Um, as it had been about uh, William Carlos Williams. And both deliberately chose not their own hometowns, but Patterson as, as a subject. What happens to uh, the, the romantic, uh, the, the thing that comes out of uh, these heroes in quest of a, a holy thing or a marvelous thing or so on, as it gets into um, the modern period, is that all of these kind of narratives ends with your having to be the, the hero having to become uh, accommodate to pretty much the world as it is. There is no marvelous at the end. There's no holy grail, no chalice. No, you have to adjust yourself to the world as it is. And that's basically the, the story that George uh, tells in the introduction to the book, Patterson, uh, where he says he had, a, he had a dream that he was the, the mayor was going to transform the whole place and make it into something else. And then he realized, well, that's no fun. That's, that's not what it is. And what I really like is the world mostly as it is. And that's the photographs or, of, of that world. Um, one of the, uh, and, and just, you know, I'm, George has uh, uh, put some of these stories, American Pilgrimage, and Pilgrimage is a kind of quest going back to, you know, the, the, the home of another hero and, and so on. Um, but uh, the, one of the most uh, compelling books for me um, that George has done is called Tice Town, uh, which is a, a photographs and narrative and documents about an actual place um, in um, uh, central New Jersey. Um, you kind of see the edges of where it would be off the Garden State Parkway as you go in south of where the waters come into it. Um, but uh, this was took 16 years to, to work on this, I guess. Um, and it's 48 pages. Um, a lot of photographs of nature of a, uh, but also it's, a, it's an album um, that has pictures of distant relatives whom George never knew. But he went to study uh, his own genealogy, find out where his family came from on his father's side and went through the process of studying his genealogy and then discovered some of the uh, remnants of the family that had, had stayed in this uh, um, little town, a Tice town, um, not an incorporated town, but that's what it was called because there were all Tices around. Um, and just in terms of thinking about a quest, um, so he goes on this quest and he, he discovers uh, people with remarkable likenesses to the Tice family, for one thing, um, and um, a young boy who had died in the sort of, there's a sad story in, in, uh, uh, in the narrative, and, uh, but it's about looking for the place, you know, it's, uh, a place that your family came from, even if you don't have a memory of where you came from. But when you think about uh, uh, a quest romance in the medieval sense of the person ending at a, a holy place or finding a, a, a grail or a chalice or something, this is what's discovered in Tice Town. And if you think about a pilgrimage as going to a holy place, this is like what's left of the of the holy place. This is the steps to what was once a church. And um, think of that chalice or object that you want to discover and there's a sharp pottery there. So um, a lot for me of what George's um, photographs are about is about learning about what is. And um, there are a lot of other things in it, but that's I came to George's work um, through George's work directly. Um, I worked at the New York Museum for 13 years, and every December, 
just before Christmas. Christmas came early because George would come to the museum and would come bearing gifts from the museum. And over the past 30 plus years since 1980, George has really helped as one of the most important donor to the Newark Museum's collection of photography. He only once donated his own work, I should say, and that was actually the first donation that came in 1980, which um, came on the heels of an exhibition that the museum organized devoted to contemporary New Jersey uh, photographers. And George gave the museum a portfolio of some of his early work, and a piece of that is actually included in a show that is up right now at the Newark Museum called Seeing Beyond the Moment, the legacy, the photographic legacy and gifts of George Tice. Um, and so I put this show together, um, and part of the desire behind this show was to share with everyone not only George's work, but the fact that George has impacted so many photographers over the course of his career and has had a profound influence on the New York Museum's collection. And this, of course, you just talked about origins, and for many ways I think that George's um, profound commitment and care for the Newark Museum goes back from origins, from growing up in the city of Newark. This was his city. And so, um, in many ways, he's really taken care of it and helped to create this really outstanding collection of um, 20th century and 19th century photography. Um, I think one of the things that's um, often you don't find with artists is that they are very capable at articulating their ideas. George is not one of those. George is very capable at articulating his ideas. And I wonder if that's also part of the draw with books, is that his introductions also really open up, I think, his work for us. And so when I was thinking about George's role with the museum, his role as um, a photographer, and reading through um, many of his, um, his books and texts, um, there was a particular passage that really struck me, and I used that as, using his own words, as the title for the exhibition, See the Young Woman. So I just want to read George um, for, for a second, um, because I think it sums up a lot of what we're talking about here and a lot of what we see and the depths of layers of what we see when we turn to George's work. So George wrote, it takes the passage of time before an image of a commonplace subject can be assessed. The great difficulty of what I attempt is seeing beyond the moment. The everydayness of life gets in the way of the eternal. And I think what both of you have been saying is that in many ways, um, George captures these moments, but what he's saying is that in order to get to this moment, there was a past that we had to go through to get there. But there's also a future. And so in many ways, I think that George's photographs capture a particular moment that's really pregnant with past, present, and future for, um, for me. And I think um, this is uh, part of the challenge of what he's, what he's doing in his um, photographs. Um, so I thought I'd show you some of the images that um, are in the Newark Museum show and talk to you, too, about what um, I've learned. Because I feel like I've learned so much both from talking with George, but also very much being fortunate to be a curator, you get to hang out with the stuff. You get to go into storage. You know, I could go into storage and pull out George's photographs um, and look at them closely. And it was through that direct connection with the objects that, frankly, I feel that I've learned so much about photography, both through George's work and through the gifts that he's um, given to the museum. Um, and so actually, just last year, no, this year, it's still this year, um, we received a, don a donation um, from George's daughter, Jennifer, who's here, um, of a piece that's also, you can also see it on, on view here. It's a fantastic planting and prints of the oak tree in Holmdale, New Jersey. So it's over on this long wall, too. So make sure when we're done that you have a chance to look at it. Um, because I have to say, this piece truly took my breath away. Um, there's something, it's just so, I can't tell you how magical and how fortunate we are to be, I think that's fine, yeah, to be able to spend time with, with an actual art object. Um, and in this particular case, for me, this piece just was so shiny. It's a palladium print. This is a process, and I should say too that, um, that um, as David mentioned as well, George's um, role as a technical photographer, his role as a printer is incredible. Um, and when you look at a piece like this, in some ways it could be a lithograph or a drawing, but it's a palladium print, which is a very complicated photographic te um, technique that George works. A lot of his magic happens both in the moment when he, this is off the parkway, right? George, this was this, this uh, scene of the tree. And we know the history of the tree, too, because 
tree isn't doing so well now, unfortunately. Um, but this is a moment um, and it's doing great. And you have to imagine, too, so there's this moment, this tree is captured, you know, and it's the <coughs> parkway is right off to the side, but you wouldn't know that in this particular moment. We're really focused really on the tree, but not just the tree, but also the, the, the winter. Um, which has such incredible detail of the grass here, this incredible composition with the grass. And each part, each component of this photograph has a really unique texture to it. Um, palladium prints, part of, um, I think, its magic is that it's it's not a type of technique that gives you those incredibly strong contrasts of dark and white. Instead, it's all about subtlety. And you can see this, I think, in person um, here. Subtle gradations of, of hue and, and um, color. And so you just get this incredible, like, it just has texture. It just has living texture. And I just, when, when George brought this to us at the beginning of the year, um, our director and other curators were all, we were all just couldn't stop staring at it. It was just the most amazing thing. And so when just putting together or seeing the young moment, um, this is one of the first pictures that you see when you come into the collection because I felt that um, if, I could have, if I had this experience of just wow, I think I wanted to make sure that the visitors the museum could also share that and have that. Um, experience of what George um, gives to the world. So to me, this is just an incredibly, incredible um, example sort of things <laughs> George's work. And then there's this side of George, too. And, and so this actually, there's two pieces to the show that really open. There's a front wall. One side is the oak tree. The other side is the mobile station, which is actually, you can also see this in person. It's right behind the screen. So after we're done, we can, we can get up close um, to it. And of course, this is also, um, to me, just it's always been a favorite piece. I remember cataloging this piece um, when it came into the museum's um, collection um, in 2007. And again, just pouring over, and this is an example, you know, another Palladium print, um, just the incredible gradation of grays and so forth, and texture that comes through the scene. But also, it's another side of George's work um, that, again, has, he's focused on throughout his career, um, from, the na from nature to also the urban scene and the urban environment. And um, you know this contrast between the fluorescent and natural lights and the water tower, and then in the background you do have those um, the sense of trees and and nature. Oh, sorry. I'll just go back. Yeah. Yes. Um, so over the years, um, George, like I said, has donated I think it's about 150 photographs to the New York Museum's collection. I think he's the largest donor to the museum's collection. It's a, it's a remarkable relationship um, and gift he's given to the, to the museum. Um, and this has included works that George himself has printed. And I'm sure most of you know that George um, is a master printer and um, was um, selected by Edward Steichen to be his master printer. Um, and over the years, George worked with Steichen and also worked with Steichen's estate, Joanna Steichen, to produce um, portfolios of Steichen's work. And this is one example, this really beautiful nude of um, Miss Sosa um, from uh, one of the portfolios George printed of, um, of Steichen's work. And like David mentioned, of course, um, Steichen discovered George um, while he was in the Navy, and George had published a remarkable photograph and so I can recognize it and then brought George's work into the Museum of Modern Arts collection in 1959, um, which was your first museum acquisition, I think, right? Yes. Yes. Not bad. <laughs> uh, this is another um, artist, a photographer that George printed for, um, Francis Joseph Rougier. Um, one of the themes that I have found when I was looking um, because I have to say at first when I started off thinking, how am I going to choose about, there's 30 works that are in this, in this exhibition, and I just thought, you know, out of 150, or at least I'm limited to 150 works that are in the collection, but how do you choose out of, because everything is really um, remarkable. And part of what drove that decision making involved, you know, finding themes and um, maybe visual connections and so forth in um, George's collecting. Um, in particular, and there is a certain under threat, a thread of um, an interest in sort of the weird or the surreal that certainly comes through, and you certainly see this with Brugere's work. But what you also see with this work that George printed, I think, is also George's um, 
interests or um, ties to artists who again are um, really talented as technicians. And someone like Roger, or we'll see another work by Jerry Olsman, for example, and many other photographers um, were really masters of their craft. And I think that George was is continues to be drawn to these like-minded, um, like you know, these these soul, developed souls, if you will, um, in photography. And so for um, Another example, just to, sorry, could you, is um, the work that George did for printing Edward Weston's um, uh, work. And um, this includes a portfolio of photographs of his son, Neil. Um, we have uh, three of those that are up at the museum um, at this time. Um, they're just incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Another artist that George printed um, printed for, and this particular piece has always been a particular favorite, I have to say, in the museum, is this work by Marion Post Wolcott, um, which you know is just taken um, during the WPA era, captured when she was traveling um, through the South, um, and then George passed. Uh, was it after she? No, she was. I didn't actually print this. This was printed by her. Oh, this was printed by her. Okay. This. So what I should say then is that this is also a piece that. George, and was, this is another interesting thread to, I think, George's story, is that the photographers that he collected, um, either through purchase or through trade as well, which sometimes you all would, would trade pieces. And so I think part of, too, what the collection really shows you is just how tight and connected, how connected George has been throughout his career with the photographic world. Uh, I apologize for these really terrible images, um, but part of what um, George has also um, helped the museum do is also tell the history of the photographic medium itself. And on the left is a holotype or telbotype um, by William Henry Fox Talbot, who was a British photographer, early photographer, um, who right around the same time as Daguerre was also, as many other um, people were, were coming to this point of figuring out how to transfer what you see in the world onto, um, in this case, um, a, work, a piece of paper. Talbot was uh, really broke through that with study of chemistry um, and playing with uh, different salts and silver um, combinations um, to figure out how to transfer what you see onto, onto, um, onto something that you can hold, onto something, you know, a way that you can actually retain, retain an image. Um, this particular piece represents a, um, a dining room table. Talbot often took many, many of these uh, holotypes of um, different plates and cutlery and things of that on this table. It's still lives in photography is very early, but this is a really incredibly early moment of, in photographic history from about 1840. At the same time, George also gave us um, an autochrome. Um, and this particular, you can see on the right, is a dye transfer print he made from the autochrome by Alfred Stieglitz, a Marie Rapp in um, Stieglitz's 291 gallery. Um, and autochrome was, one of, it was a tremendous breakthrough in the early 20th century into color photography. Um, uh, autochromes actually really only exist as these relatively small um, glass, often black glass, pieces that really you can only experience through projection. George um, not only gave the museum one of the, they're incredibly rare, I should say incredibly rare. There's only about 20 autochromes that um, are extant by Stieglitz, some um, that are incredibly rare. Um, so we have the actual autochrome, which is a fascinating um, piece to, to look at and to study, um, and also this print that George made um, of this, of this uh, regular 291. Um, again, this was, this was such a breakthrough because photographers have always wanted to be able to capture things and works in the world in color. And this was um, just, you know, gave photographers this opportunity to do that. And that's actually something Stieglitz, interestingly enough, learned from Steichen, who they were all in Europe at the same time, and this um, technology was announced, and Steichen went and then he bought some um, autochrome materials for Stieglitz, who then started to um, um, work in color. And then obviously um, color photography evolves from them, but this is really, these are both two remarkable moments of firsts in the history of photography to highlight. Um, and just other, some other examples of artists, historical artists that George has given to the museum. Another um, fascinating um, type, te 
technique of photography, the photographer, you can see here in Edward Curtis's um, image of a mother and child. Um, also, um, certainly really important social history in Lewis Hines, the boy picking cotton. Um, again, these really reveal and help the museum tell this broader story of, of what not only is happening within the history of photography, but also what was happening within the social history of the country as well. And I think um, you're, you all were just talking about um, George capturing particularly American imagery, and I think that also in his choice of works and in many of the pieces he's given to the museum, that aesthetic, that sensitivity is carried through as well in the choices and what he's collected. Um, this is uh, also George's role as a mentor and a teacher. I think he's also been very profound. He's, he's taught in Maine every summer for many years, and Sally Mann was, um, took one of his courses and this is an example of a piece that I think you got through trade with Sally. Or something. Uh, got Dean published her first book, and I wrote a blurb for the back. She gave me this as a gift. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, so this is a great example of, from her site, scene book of um, the, again the playing and print technique that again has this incredible texture. It's one of those just, just you know, incredible. Um, and this is uh, another recent donation of Tim Barnwell's um, work. This is a fantastic series of scenes from Appalachia that Tim produced. And this is such a, this print is so strong and so incredibly crisp and the perspective is just so profound. Um, this cow is just so right there in your face and yet at the same time, you really get a sense of, of the farmer and um, you know, his working in the land. And again, I think this shows again, you know, George's own work in um, exploring parts of the United States and different cultures, I think also is something, you know, again, his, his connection with Tim Barnwell, I think that there's some kind of in many ways there. And I mentioned Wilson's work as well as the, just an incredible technician um, who created these, you know, sort of weird, surrealist um, types of um, images again, through the use of double exposure, there's no Photoshop at all used in, in these, you know, again, just uh, really like working with negatives and just an incredible, um, incredibly fine um, technician. And this is another, I think this is the last image, it's another um, work that George has given to the Museum of Edward Weston's work. This particular piece was printed by his son, um, Cole Weston. Um, but again, you see, like in George's work, that draw to finding um, patterns and form within nature. And I think one of the things that I love so much about George's work, and so as I look around, is the way his eye can find order within the world um, and make you see your world in a totally different way. And that, to me, I think is the great sign of an amazing artist. And not only an amazing artist, but also an incredibly generous one um, who has left incredibly important work on the North Museum. So we can take some uh, questions and yeah. I found the uh, I found the comparison between the romantic history very interesting and kind of woke up my own Irish side and uh, thinking about George, uh, whether traditionally whether it was a grail or a chalice or not, the hero of the journey was in some ways transformed by, and I think that's certainly true of George, who I consider a, a seer, like a, <coughs> uh, what's the Irish, what's the Irish, a druid like a druid, but I think the important thing to me is that, is that uh, George did find the chalice and the grail, and that's what you're looking at. Uh, and it's through that that he became transformed. And as I recall, I think it's an important point, as I recall, George imagined himself not a mayor of Patterson, but a prince of Patterson. And a prince is a lot more romantic than a mayor. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, that's an important correction. <laughs> <laughs>
One of the words that was used um, in your uh, presentation and by a number of you others was the word hero. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if I could ask Mr. Tice some of his photographic heroes. Who were the, some of the people that might have inspired you? Sam Kennedy. Maybe that's the first time we saw right there. <laughs> well, initially, when I was 14 and started the camera club, there was other people in the camera club. I really didn't know anything about the history of photography uh, until after I got out of the Navy and started going to museum modern art and writing books. But the people at the uh, high point now that's been the greatest influence would be uh, Frederick Evans, 19th century uh, British photographer who worked in Platinum, uh, Walker Evans, Western. I think both Walker Adams and Edward West on the 8x10 new camera, well, they all probably use uh, the big camera. <clears throat> but uh, none of them did I want to be uh, too important to me. I read the day books of Edward West on once, and I said, I'll never read these again because you'd be too great an influence. You don't, want, you don't be like anyone else. You want to be distinctive. But they were the three that had most slanted uh, uh, my, my, my vision for what I did. I have one last question. Um, if you visit George's basement, you see the most amazing dark work. I assume you still work. But what I'm curious about is how are you making, or if you're making a transition to the digital age, and how has this affected your photography or how you take photographs or how you sell photographs? I mean, are you doing, are you reproducing them differently now than you used to when you used to hold them up and wait 30 seconds on the drip? Well, I don't own a digital camera. Uh, I'm involved in it when they make my books. It's uh, digitized. These big platinum prints are made under my supervision in Belgium where they make take my 8x10 negatives and enlarge it to 20x24 and then print it in uh, from three negatives, highlights, little tones, and shadows. Uh, the negatives are punched and uh, printed through each, each negative. Uh, so that, that I used to make 8x10 flat So to do this, uh, I am jumping into the digital age in a limited way. And did they do those digitally or did they do them chemically? No, these are hand colored platinum. Plating. So they still are platinum? Some are all plated. The brown ones are all plated. The ones that are just a warm black uh, are platinum. Plating. And which is a contact process, so you have to have a negative this size. But I have no intention of uh, using, uh, doing digital photography as long as they keep making film and paper. It's good. Yeah, it's only. <laughs> George, do you find or do you have younger photographers coming to speak to you? I just wonder because um, with this rise of digital photography, but now if you're seeing younger photographers coming back to these older photographic processes. Well, Perry, who's told a story about my entertaining the idea of being the Prince of Pride, said he was a young photographer coming to me, but I was just trying to Yes. Especially at old things. He used to get letters in the mail, and I get an email. Do you sell them the same way? They sell primarily to galleries. To galleries. I, I just I have a question involving the 
the social history of uh, Patterson. And uh, I, I think the title was uh, The City uh, That Went Wrong. And as Patterson, uh, <clears throat> over the past number of years, has been written out of American history, I suspect there will come a time that historians are going to rediscover the need to discuss the history of Patterson. And I was wondering if you saw these images making their way into uh, sociological textbooks or history textbooks that would be taught in the uh, public school system. You know, as, as a means for teaching history in sociology. You mean, am I aware of that, that usage of them? Are you aware, will there, and do you envision in the future more usage of them? Well, they are, they are history at you know, a particular time. These are, I began Patterson in 67. And I'm, I can't say I'm finished, but you know, if I really wanted to go out and photograph and find a sure place to walk back with the picture, I got a Patterson. Because it's very rich. Richard Newark? <laughs> yes. You <laughs> don't have to say Paul's in the art, you don't have to carry it down in the art. But I think uh, one of the interesting things, um, uh, since um, actually mentioning Walker Evans, 75 years since he had his first exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, and Lincoln Kirstein wrote an, an, an essay about that exhibit, and um, there's, you know, there's, uh, there are some people who uh, tend to be pretty much documentary photographers, other people who are artistic photographers, and I think one of the remarkable things about uh, about these photographs is, and, and partly it's the clarity of the focus in the, in the detail, is that they uh, accomplish both things. Um, and um, that you can uh, look at them as uh, aesthetic objects or if you wanted to really go back into social history, um, uh, you could find uh, a lot that's significant in them. Uh, or even that uh, the, uh, if, if you wanted to uh, get the, the, you know, the culture of, um, of uh, the borderline suburban area of Patterson Clifton, you get the picture of the, in the 1970s. Um, those kinds of things uh, really stand out. Um, and one of the things, um, I, would, I, I lived in New Brunswick in, um, from 1975, and I lived in uh, central New Jersey in 1975 to uh, 1998. Um, and about the time that Urban Romantic uh, came out, and um, so George had photographed uh, my dry cleaners and places that the house on Sudan Street and all these places that. So um, I had the feeling at, at the time that I was living in a George Dice photograph. Um, uh, but they really do capture uh, that, that the, those moments in time and. Um, uh, you know, serve, serve that purpose at the same time that they are um, uh, absolutely exquisite photographs. And um, House of Sudan Street is, is an example of that. It's, just, it's, um, it's archetypal in the way that it looks at the piece of Lake Victorian architecture and the tones of it and the way the trees capture it, um, those kinds of things. So I think that, you know, it's remarkable that it's remarkable for. Um, and part of it is the amount of time it takes to take one of these, set up and take one of these exposures. Um, and that's uh, what I think is interesting in terms of the history of photography is that increasingly from about the time of, of Walter Evans, it's all speed, 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 speed. Um, how, fast can, how fast is the film? Uh, how fast can you take shots? And, and all those kinds of things. And that leads a lot of uh, photographers to you know, kind of, um, to use an expression, take cheap shots. And, um, and these are the, you know, 
these are considered, um, not that, I mean, of evidence that were composed as photographs and so on, but increasingly there was this um, quick shot kind of mentality. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, I think that George's work, I completely agree with you, it does have a certain documentary element to it, and yet it's so far beyond that that in some ways you have to realize he's pre presenting you with the vision of it. He's not just documenting something. He's, a, he's an artist. He's, he's presenting you with an interpretation of a particular place, a particular site. Um, you know, I can see it right now because I have an angle, but if we think of like the mobile station, Piece, which I find to be um, so. This piece, to me, I mean, this is one of George's I iconic scenes. Um, it captures this particular moment. You have this 70s type car. You have, you know, this gas culture, car culture. You can think of, you know, um, you know, just that time. But then you have this. It, to me, the, the, what keeps me coming back to this piece, which again, you know, to me, is an element of what makes it such a great work of art, is that every time you come back to it, it's bringing something new to you. It's making you think about something new. It's making you, and there's, to me, sometimes I see that water tower as being this ominous sort of alien-like presence at the time. Other times I can think of it within, you know, just literally a water tower and, and that, you know, do you know what I mean? Like the light is also incredibly evocative and kind of mysterious, and yet I can also think about <coughs> being in that kind of situation, the dark and that sort of feeling of those sort of artificial lights as well. Um, so that to me, again, like it, there's these depths and layers that, that propel George's work to something um, just beyond just mere social documentary um, pieces. They're just um, incredible works of art, very thought out. I mean, it also, just again, to come back to George's technique, for him to even be able to get this, with the subtlety, you know, the gray tones of the water tower with the bright white lights of those fluorescent lights, you know, over the gas pumps, for example, it's just an incredible, virtual force of, of, um, of photographic expertise. Um, so there's all these different ways into it that I feel with documentary photographs you don't often get. Like they, they function, they record a particular moment, but I think George is also providing us with a commentary on a particular moment. Every time I see it, I see H.G. Wells as World of Worlds. The spaceship just landed and it's there in the field and we don't know what that looks like. Uh, one of the uh, things, just to carry forward the discussion of the, of the documentary versus aesthetic, um, I wonder how important a, the scale of the image is. And just focusing on Pettit's mobile station, for instance, um, there was a, a print of that in Westwood at the uh, uh, gallery there, which is quite a bit larger than that. and. Um, you, you get a much different, at, at that size and perhaps even reduced in uh, a book, it does look more like a, a, a document, a photograph of a particular place and time of a moment. But when the scale is uh, 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 made larger, it has a, I think it has a, a much different impact on the viewer. And the water tower almost has the uh, same effect as looking at a cathedral or something. It, it's not just monumental. It has some kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word transcendent, but I can't think of another uh, a substitute for that. But it, it does have a, an ethereal or some other uh, numinous quality to it. That, uh, it might not be able, might not be able to pick up in uh, a more reduced uh, image. I, well, I, do, I think he has a genius for framing. I mean, that Chrysler picture, you know, you look at that and you say, A, how in the world did he take that picture? You know, where was he when he took it? But you can't imagine that taken from any other angle of work. I mean, you see all of New York, you see the head. You couldn't, you couldn't put any element in that in a different place and have the same picture. And you can look at all, you know, the used car one and the cot. The way he cropped those in the camera is just terrific. And it's not someone who took 50 pictures and then picked the best one. You know, it's someone who got it right the first time and just knew what to leave out and what to put in. The most important, what to leave out. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a chart of eight car Each corner has two. Well, you picked the right one. <laughs> 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 
I picked a lot of fancy new chairs. <laughs> it, it, it didn't fall off. <laughs> follow up on what John was saying in the business of, of almost having a cathedral-like presence. A lot of the photographs remind me when I'm looking at them of my place in the world, which is a humble, small place. And I think that, that in some ways, that reflects who George is. Um, George understands the difference between the individual and his or her place in the world and all of the things that are around us that are are going to outlast us and yet be part of, or we will be part of them. It's a, a really interesting thing because I do see him in the corners of the pictures. Very well said. The man from Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I, I think uh, the, the, the images made with 8 by 10 are absolutely monumental and I have a tremendous magnificence about them. But I have to say, I've seen a lot of George's work in like street photography, some done with a minox. And I think, uh, I mean, I, there are many I think of, but there's one in particular I think he shot in Russia with a, with a Leica or some third party kind. But I have the same monumentality uh, so that even when the smaller negative doesn't convey the richness of tone, it's his vision still comes through, and it still has the same impact. Uh, so he can do the same thing with the minops as he does with the 8x10. I think it's important to just make that distinction. It's like looking at two different products. They have to be judged differently, but in a sense, they, they have equal monumentality. Oh, you, you did. Um, Stonewall's great skies. What, what kind of camera did you use? Like, no, here. So this is a 35. Yeah. This is a 35 millimeter all shot, and much, you know, as as you're saying, it it doesn't reduce the quality. Of, of course, I mean, when it's when it's printed, it's a different thing than, than when you see a photograph on the wall. Right? Right. Right. Um, it's still uh, impressive. Uh, uh, tones to the images. What did you use for Artie, George? Was that a Foley? Uh, at that time, I was using a Pentax 35 movie. So, what has been your favorite camera to work with, or does it just depend? Is there... Well, the 810 camera I bought due in 69, so that doesn't become obsolete no matter what. How technology changes. That's my favorite. Sad one. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, well, I think you've talked to me when you were photographed about the um, oak tree. And just again, you know, the amount of work it takes to get to the location, waiting, you know, and set it and get that right moment. It's quite a laborious physical task, you know. And so I think maybe part of what we see in you too, you know, it's just like there's all of you is involved in getting this particular shot, but it's not just getting the shot, but then it's also bringing it back to, this, to the dark room and working with that. It's just... Well, some photographers have the philosophy that you should shoot every day, you should go out photograph every day. And uh, I took one picture in the last year, you know, but it was a good one. <laughs> so it was more of an event when I go to photograph. The more meaningful than on the trip, you can forget what you've done until you come back and develop your film. What's the hardest thing about making a book? Is that the publisher? You gotta go beyond that. Yeah, there's a good one in Boston. Yeah, he's not a good no, I mean technically, what, 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 what is, uh, for you as, a, as the person who creates the original, what's the most difficult part about transferring all that to book? Well, the process, you know, you're doing it, uh, you know, so in the real set, or you're doing tritone and quad tone, there's this difference in how close to the original photograph you get. So each 
each time you go up, it's more money. And not all publishers are willing to spend the money on photography books to get a, a good facsimile. Do you go and press for all of them? And when I didn't, I was sorry. But in the beginning, when Patterson was published, and was published by Murray and Reviewer, um, they didn't want the photographer on press. Double Day didn't want the photographer on press. And then all of a sudden it turned around, they wanted the photographer to take some of the responsibility. He signed the form, okay. But it, all, it all changed. But now you're going press. Yes, when, I mean, there's, there's different little things that I can catch. Just like uh, a proofreader, there's different things I'll catch when you write an essay. I mean, you're aiming for perfection, so you try to get close to it. Okay, Tristan. Where did Christy go? Oh, that's right. Any more questions? How long does the show run? Oh, it's up on February 9th. Um, so, um, actually, we just had a question. The museum is open Wednesdays through Sundays from 12 to 5. So is there a book on the show? Unfortunately, no, but we do have George's book, sell new book, latest book. We have yep. Sell and Scene. It's a gorgeous book, which you can purchase at the museum shop, as well as a selection of many of his other books. So, please, yeah, absolutely. Um, please do visit. Um, and also throughout the permanent collection galleries, you can see other works, photographic works that George has given to the museum over the years. Um, his donations are in constant um, rotation in the permanent galleries. So his work, the photographer's work. Can I ask one question? Just another a technical question. Um, mention both made about the beef, blacks, and grays. And I noticed, I think in a film that was made of you, that was of you're using just a, a, a handheld, um, like, is it reflective? Um, a meter? Do you use a, a, a spot meter in a zone system, sort of? No. Oh. I don't use a zone system, but I don't use a, a spot meter. I use a Luna Pro meter I bought about 30 years ago, and it still works. I think it's just exposed for the blocks. And now you won't see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you halfway, gave, you halfway gave it away in the film. At, some, at one point, you talked a little. Yeah, about yeah. He, he says to me in the dark room, oh, "What are you looking at?" I'm looking at a test strip yeah. that I just made in the dark. I turn on the white light, and and right. one of the filmmakers says to me, uh, "What are you looking for at this point?" And I say, "The minimum exposure." To achieve black that reveals the highlight detail. Right. So you can't have one exposure for the shadows and another for the highlights. Right. That's even one exposure. Right. Like I can only take one sheet of film and make it a print, I can make three sheets of film. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to thank our panelists, Mary Kate 